Oh, good morning, everybody. Oh, sorry, got my I got the volume completely backwards there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so welcome to the weekly live stream here uh, with me, Scott Dettweiler, and we're going to be looking at Capture One today. We're not going to be going into Photoshop. We're going to be working on some styles and uh, presets, kind of things like that. I thought that would be kind of a, a little bit deeper dive than we normally do into those things. Um, as I know, a lot of people like to create their own styles uh, because Capture One doesn't use LUTs. Uh, there's a lot of um, I know, so a lot of leeway for us to do our own thing because the presets that you can purchase are expensive in my mind uh, versus, you know, you can get LUTs falling out of a tree for Lightroom without a problem. So I thought we'd go over some, some of that today and show you some of the ins and outs of that. Uh, before we get started, though, here's uh, this month's free texture. So if you are a supporter of the channel, meaning you click in the giant join button below any video, uh, this new galactic texture is yours. These are all hand painted by me uh, digitally. Uh, and you see that, and there's a tremendous amount of detail in each one of these. And these are all huge, uh, and they are yours uh, to use as you would like in your own work. Uh, there are a bunch of them, and depending on your channel membership, you either get the Photoshop files of what we work on here on the channel with all the layers intact. So if you want to see how I retouch skin and you want to reference it later, that's all available for you here. And there's a few in here. I just started doing this a few weeks ago, so there's six of them in there. Uh, for the last six months, then all these textures are yours as well. So for the cost of a Starbucks every month, you can help the channel and get all this stuff for free. And there's some Capture One styles in here, like we're going to create today. Uh, so as I create these, I kind of toss these in here. And these are ones I actually use. These aren't just ones that I'm creating for you, and then I'm like, eh, whatever. I use these styles uh, almost every day uh, as either a point of departure, uh, which is typical, or sometimes I'm just trying to get it done, and I already like the way they look, then we're just going to use them. Anyway, uh, so today we're going to work on this set here with Amber. So um, a boudoir photographer, so if you don't know that, then you can be prepared for the fact there's a little bit of boudoir on this on this uh, channel. Uh, we do some other ones as well uh, that are not safe for work, and those are in the member area as well, or sometimes they're live stream on Discord. So um, I haven't been on Discord as much uh, lately as I used to be in the past. I've uh, just been really busy. Got Shutterfest coming up in a couple of weeks, and then uh, tech, uh, followed immediately by Texas School of Photography, which is a week long when you're stuck with me for a whole week, and we go over a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then uh, back to Houston, and then down to uh, Florida later in the year. I'm all over the darn place. Anyway, let's talk about presets today. Uh, so let's start with kind of, I think, one of the major blunders or, or things that people walk into or problems you're going to run into. So let's start with this image here. So I love this image. It's great. It's in focus. It's control spacebar, by the way, to get your loop uh, to pop up. Um, very handy. It's also up here if you want to change the size on things on it. Uh, you just click on click and hold. Well, it needs to be click and hold. There you go. Clip loop size and then the zoom. I like just 100 and normal. I don't need it to be outrageous. By the way, you can also loop over a thumbnail. You don't need to uh, necessarily loop over the one that's active. Um, so you can go over thumbnails as well, which is, I think, pretty darn cool for being able to find things quickly. Anyway, so the first thing we're going to note is that this is a bit bright. And uh, I know a lot of people would be, wow, you should really try bringing those highlights back. You know, um, to me, this isn't the star of the show, but I do agree this is a bit bright, but um, not a problem. We'll just pull the highlights back a little bit. And there we go. Now we can see some of that curtain. I guess if that's exciting for you, then there's some curtain for you. Anyway. Uh, so let's say we pull the highlight back on this, or maybe we just pull the exposure down completely. No, no, that doesn't look as good, does it? So let's go ahead and pull down the highlight like this. And so, okay, and then we say, okay, we're done with that. And um, I like the crop on this. This is nice. Uh, let's let's go ahead and make a preset for this. Okay, I know it's a st stupid, simple thing. But let's say we go ahead and we want to make a preset of this. Now... One of the problems I run into with, with this is knowledge of what I did here and that it does not apply to every picture. And I think this is one of the bigger problems with people who create presets, even in uh, the Lightroom situation, is that we automatically assume everything we've changed in an image is, should be part of our style. So if we go down here to our adjustment clipboard, we can we can actually copy up the changes for this by clicking copy here. And we can see that the exposure highlight recovery is one of the things that is part of this new style we're working on here. Well, I don't necessarily want that to be part of every one of these images. So be careful with these exposure settings when you're creating your presets. They are not things that may apply to every image. For instance, you may apply this to something later that's a dark and moody image because you like it, but all of a sudden all the highlights are gone and you're like, what the hell happened? Well, it's because you are adjusting exposure 
as part of a style. So I would tell you not to do this. Another one you'll run into is cropping. So say for example, this one needs a bit of love for cropping. Uh, it's also crooked, which drives me absolutely nuts. So say I want something along this lines here. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's beautiful. Let's run with that. Okay. And then again, I copy this up because we're going to create a, a style from it. You'll notice that by the way, up here, there's all these, these adjustment in the adjustment clipboard, there's all these little tiny nuances for things you can do in here. Um, this is the one that I really like. It will not display a crop change. So if you're wondering why crop doesn't show up as a checkbox, checkbox down here, like the adjustment uh, for the highlight recovery did, it's because this here, this accept composition, because what are the odds that the crop you make on this image is one you're going to want to make on every single image to which you apply this to. So this was actually pretty smart on their part is to say, make sure that we don't include the crop when we're trying to create a style that we want to put out because that's not really going to be very handy, obviously. Uh, so this is the, this is one of the main things that you have to watch out for if you're wondering why crop isn't showing up. But that's, uh, that's the reason you're going to see that. And I just leave it on adjusted except composition, right? Okay, so that's that's two of the, two of the gotchas. So let's, let's work on actually trying to create a little bit more serious of a style here. Let's go to the one, I love this image here. Uh, so what I do is I make my images red when I like them. Now it's regardless of whether or not the client likes them, uh, this is one I like. So in certain situations from a sales standpoint, I may retouch an image that I really love because chances are the client is really going to love it too. I mean, I'm not going to like a picture where they're like, hmm, you know, I look kind of derpy in that picture. Well, of course I'm, I'm going to pick a picture that I think is great. They're going to love it and I'm going to retouch it. So basically every image that I take the time to turn to color red and retouch before I have the client meeting is one I'm going to sell and keep that in mind. So my boudoir packages are not tremendously expensive. Um, they start at like $900. So, I mean, $600, $900 is pretty typical, but I just had a $4,500 sale from a $900 client because I charge per additional image in a book and it, it, books come with 18 and she ended up putting 52 images in the book, you know, and she loved, she loved all these images, but I took time to retouch a lot of them before we got to that point. So strategy is you want to try and make the best impression on the images when they get there. Now, I know a lot of people who use, uh, there's a product called Portraiture, which kind of does a quick, super fast skin retouching, and it does not do a great job, but it does a good enough job that you can probably get more sales because the images are not things people are like vacillating over, like, mm, my acne is kind of bad on that one or whatever. It fixes that. Now, I would not leave them that way. Um, I would go back and retouch them properly for a sale, but for what we call in-person sales or that sales cycle, uh, that's a pretty good tool actually, because you can again get more sales because the images are closer to, to done at that point. So let's retouch this image here from just a, just from the exposure standpoint. So it's maybe a bit bright. I always shoot a little bit farther this way. Uh, if you haven't heard me bitch about this before, <laughs> uh, on your histogram here, this, this rightmost quadrant here is half of your image data. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm just going to underexpose my picture by one stop because I like the look of it. Well, you're sacrificing half of the image data. So like these dark areas down in here that are still on the graph would not be on the graph if I underexposed it by one stop. If I did this and think, wow, this looks a lot better in the back of my camera, all this is gone now. It fell off the edge. So I tend to, um, I tend to shoot to the right is what this term is called. Don't touch the wall but get as close as you can, and you can always darken it. You can always darken it. Now I can subjectively pick what I want, but now this is clean because it's actually on the graph. It's not uh, It's not sacrificed to the gods, right? And then I usually hover over the skin, the bright points of the skin. I like to see almost always on this line or a little bit to the left of it. So uh, this looks pretty good, maybe even a little bit darker. If you hold on your Alt key, by the way, you can do minute controls with this. It won't do uh, big, big maneuvers. So it's a nice way to do that versus say highlight recovery. So highlight recovery, I think takes the life out of images. Sometimes I'll even add highlight back in, in some situations like this. I think that looks a little bit nicer. So we can hit Y on our keyboard to do before and after. So that's our shot we took. And this is where we are now. It's a little bit more natural, a little less punchy. Yes. But uh, again, this is subjective. You know, you, you do the art that you want to do. In fact, I'm going to make it a little bit brighter, but I did push the highlight up a bit. Now, so far, realistically, based on what we just talked about, 
None of these adjustments are things that I should really include with the style because I'm just asking for it, right? I'm just saying, wow, every image, even some dark and moody one, I'm not going to want to lower the exposure and increase the highlight, probably. Uh, you could do a lot of these operations on a curve, which I think would be more accurate from, you know, just kind of like a kind of approach to modification. I think the curve is one of those things to say, this is more of a stylistic choice and this is more of a correction. Uh, kind of my mindset toward it. Uh, so let's say we want a little contrast. We could use the contrast slider, yes. Or what the contrast slider is really doing is pulling down the dark part of the curve and raising the upper part of the curve. More or less the same thing. So if we undo this and we use the contrast slider, it's, uh, it's kind of the same thing. Not exactly, but that's what this is supposed to kind of be doing. However, this curve also allows you to adjust luminosity only. So the, the colors will not shift violently when you're doing this. So if we say we come down a little bit here in the dark parts, we raise our highlights up a little bit. Be careful not to, to clip anything here. You don't want to do that kind of goofiness. Um, then we have a little bit of a subtlety. By the way, if you hold on your Alt key and click on that little turn arrow, it'll do a before and after for you. So you can see what it is that we did with that curve. So that's nice. I think that's that's interesting. And this is now really kind of starting to become part of the style I'm building. Uh, and I have to say, this is what I'm what I'm looking for. Now, I also like to lift the whites a little bit. Uh, it's just a thing that I or lift the blacks, I should say. So you see all the blacks there are lifted up, which again, because we properly expose this image, we know this is not trash down here. It's not all look at so there's no there's no grain no no noise issues down in here even though we're in like the darkest part of the image uh, that's because it was properly exposed and this is one of those tricks i think to getting uh, bigger prints that look better is just learn to expose with your camera okay so we'll push that up a bit which means we can probably bring this highlight slider down meaning we're making the correction here and not so much using these sliders this is for this image only okay what else do we want to do well let's go in and maybe play with color a little bit uh, so we can go into the color balance tool here, which is the one that I love, and go to, we always start, I always start in the shadows. That's just my, my, my method. And I do is I go all the way to the edge and I go all the way around. And I'm just trying to find what mood I like for this image. Right? And I almost always end up over in here somewhere. But let's do something different today. I'm push, I'm going to force myself to pick something different. Uh, so let's just go with something a little bit more interesting. So I'm just looking at this image specifically. So I got the color that I like, but it's too much. And then we'll just go ahead and grab this and pull down the color until it's the appropriate amount. And I don't make small adjustments. I wiggle it a lot and then see about where it wants to rest. So something like this looks good to me. Midtone, again, same thing. We could probably go all the way around and find something. So if we go the opposite side on the color wheel here with the midtone, that will cancel out what we did there. Now, someone had asked a question last week. They're like, hey, I have a lot of, of saturation in one color. How do I desaturate that? I'm trying to use the saturation slider. And realistically, just like a painter would do, you just add the opposite color and it will desaturate it. So by adding this blue opposite that, that color, we can adjust the skin tone here to get what we want. And you can see how desaturated she looks now. Um, so just be careful with that. But that's really how you do that. You just use the opposite color and you can introduce that type of a uh, desaturation. So if we increase this a bit, back to mid-tone. You know, we can take all the color out of her. So I guess we're coming up with something pretty styly here. Then highlights, do you want to color the, the brightest parts of the image? Now, I prefer these to typically be white. Uh, but if you find that when you're printing, they're not, uh, there's no color dropping on your printer, meaning the paper is showing through, you're going to always add a little bit of a color. And then you know that there is no true white anywhere on here. If there's a true white, it will now be a little bit yellow. By the way, if you click on that, you can then move it with your arrow key, um, which sometimes is handy if you're just trying to make just a little tiny nuance adjustment. And then the master is the end all be all to everything. That is the, the one that will make the final adjustments. But be careful with this. Uh, so if we add a curve here, pull this out. If we add a curve here and we're playing with the master, we can actually are adjusting exposure with our curve. So be careful not to blow your image out uh, when you're pushing this around because you can blow your image out. And then all kinds of goofiness. Now, what I typically like to do is take it again all the way to the top and find a color for her skin that looks natural, right? So just wiggle it until you see something you like. Like, I think that looks pretty good there. 
and then take the volume on that and pull that down until you're happy with it. So just a little bit of that. So something like this, and I could say, okay, um, that's the uh, that's the style I've created. So now let's go and create that style. And what I typically do is uh, I like to put it, up, copy it up first. Um, and then we go to this panel here, the adjustment panel, and it shows you all the adjustments you've made. Well, I don't want the exposure to be part of this, right? We talked about that already. Um, that's that's subjective only to this image, and it may not be the same for this image. Although it looks like it could use some love and exposure area. Um, I don't necessarily want to make that, uh, that, that leap. But I do want the levels, the curves. I do want the color balance. Notice crop is not there, although we didn't crop the image, but uh, same thing, still not there. Uh, and then when I'm happy with this, then I can go and we can um, copy to the clipboard or we can save the clipboard as a new style. All right, so let's talk a little bit about styles and where they're stored in Capture One because this is one of the ones that drives me absolutely batty. Uh, no, that's the, whoop, that's for all the stuff you guys get if you support the channel. So Capture One breaks a big rule on Windows and it stores things in the app data local folder. And this folder is hidden by default. Uh, so on my machine here, it's C users, SE debt, app data, local capture one. That's a, a completely asinine place to put things because by default, Windows hides this directory. Um, so you'll never find this stuff. You'll have to go in and actually turn on display hidden or type it in. And every time a new version of capture one comes out, they tend to increment these. These are major increments for the recipes, for example. Uh, so you're going to find that I have some junk in here that I need to go in and clean out. Uh, and then all these new, uh, all the new things for the web enabled for the Capture One Live, for example, are kept in here as well. Um, there's this, uh, this critical directory here, this image core directory. I'm actually going to do a separate video on this. Uh, but if you're having trouble with your video driver and you're getting all kinds of weird stuff, come in here, find whatever's in here and just delete, delete all this. Uh, and it'll rebuild it when you restart Capture One. And that will rebuild the image core, which can solve most of your problems. So if you ever wonder why stuff's going haywire, this is where you go to fix it. Anyway, so in here we have these recipes, which you've seen me destroy before and rebuild on the channel. And then we have styles 50. So in styles 50, this is where my styles are kept. So in here is the styles that you guys get every month. I give you another style. But I'm going to try and save this style here, and this is this is where you have to save it, otherwise Capture One won't be able to find it. So again, it's kind of an asinine location for it to be, but that's what it is. Uh, so we just go here, and we can just say save clipboard as style. Let's see, well, where do you want to put it? Well, I want to put it in SC Detweiler Styles, and I'm going to call it um, Sherry. Like this, and I do Sherry, and then a B and W, for example. I I might rename these because I like all my black and whites to be together, uh, but that's just me. So, uh, and then my initials, so that I know it's one that I created, and not one I purchased. And then hit that. That's it. And then we can see over here under SE Deadweather Styles, there should be a Sherry style. There we go. So we want to apply this to a bunch of images. Uh, we we can highlight this one and select all. Well, we can just select all the other ones first of all. And then control click and control click again. So you're, you're just click it, I should say. You don't have to control click it. So you see this one is a bigger border on it. That means that Capture One knows this is the master and it needs to apply to all these other things. So we can apply all of these by clicking apply, or we can also do this granularly. For example, if we want to apply just the curve, we can hold down the shift key and click on this and it will apply the curve to everything that is selected. So you can quickly kind of apply this over time if you have individual pieces. So you want to apply this exposure adjustment, which I normally would not do, but there you go. And that's by holding on the shift key and clicking on this little tiny double arrow. Or conversely, we can just go back here to this style and we can apply the style, which will apply it to all those images. Now, we can also go up and actually just pick it. So if we say, well, I just want to pick Sherry, it will go ahead and apply Sherry to all of the images. So this is a really great way to come in and quickly adjust a bunch of images. And you don't need this one selected in that case, but uh, assume that you just want to take settings from this and apply it to a lot of images. That's how you would do it. Um, I do this with metadata quite often too, where I'll come in and say, I need to make sure that her metadata is correct and my copyrights on the image and, and all this other stuff. Um, I will use this metadata tool here 
this one here and put all my copyright information in there, get it the way that I want it. And then you can just, you can click, you can shift and click on this and it will apply this metadata to all of these images. Um, I actually have a preset for my metadata right here. It's just my initials, SED. And I apply that to all these when they're imported, I actually apply them on import. Uh, but sometimes there's tiffs or things like that that I've retouched and they don't have that applied. Uh, again, I can just highlight everything, shift click on this and it applies it to everybody. So that whole shift clicking thing saves you from the dialogue that'll pop up normally. So if we go back here, for example, and we click on, uh, if we just click on this, it's gonna pop up a dialogue and say, what do you wanna do with this? Like, what are you trying to, to do? Well, I'm trying to apply this style to all these things. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's the only thing that's there in this style preset. So don't ask me a silly question like that. Just, just apply it. The alt key will also suppress the dialogue, but I use shift to just kind of get it all done right away. So that's one of those things, but just realize that this goofy location for, for these, um, these recipes is a problem. I think Capture One should change this. I think it's a completely asinine place to put it. In fact, I've blown things away before because my backup software didn't go in here and back up things because it never backs up anything in the app data folder. That's not a place where you put it. It should go in the documents folder, right? Um, so I use a product called GoodSync here. And uh, I love, by the way, love this product. And uh, I'm not trying to sell you on it or anything, but holy mackerel, I use this thing all day long. Uh, so what this does is this this on a timer does all these different things. It copies things from one machine to my network attached storage. It copies from network attached storage to backup devices. It puts it up on the, on the cloud. But one of the big ones here is it capture one core to, and that's my, my, my NAS, my network attached storage to the assets for capture one. And you can see right now it needs to update all these things. So if I just hit, whoops, let's do this again. So hit analyze. And it shows that we just have that new Sherry style needs to be applied. Because it found it here, but it didn't find it in the NAS. I just hit sync. This thing runs every, uh, I think every two hours. And it just takes and again, make sure that all this goofy location is backed up. Because I lost all my recipes. There's a whole video on me rebuilding every one of my recipes from scratch. So if you're if you're looking for how I do some of those things, there's a very detailed video on that. But make sure you back this this folder up this folder because it's in a dumb spot it's not something normally that backup software is going to see make sure you back it up i, I can't even tell you how much of a pain in the butt it was to go back and have to redo all that and then any of the other ones that you own if you weren't like i own the nordic lifestyle ones here those are in here as well and then any other of these <laughs> goofy directories like your recipes um again this is i live and die by these things but here's every one of my recipes that i use uh and I can't lose this directory again. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd cry. So so this this uh, backup here grabs everything, but it doesn't grab some of these other goofy folders. There's there, who, Don't back this up, for example. The keyword libraries is handy. So if you have a master keyword library and you keep that in here, I actually did a video on this as well. Um, but all those things, just, just go in here, find this thing and just make a copy of it and thank me later because when this thing is long gone and you're like crying like a baby because you didn't back it up like I did, <laughs> you've been warned. Uh, so yeah, take a moment today and just, just in fact, do it right now. Just take it right now. I can wait. You just go ahead and do that. You'd be a lot happier about it. Anyway, uh, so a couple other things to keep in track when you are making these uh, presets or these styles is when it comes to making black and whites. So if we have a lot of different things going on with our images, let's reset this one, for example. Um, well, let's bring it up. And I want to make a style of for this image, for example. Now, one of the things we talked about already is we don't want exposure to be included in this because this exposure thing is an issue. But I want to say this is a preset and I don't want to have to be complicated about it. What I tend to do is say, I'm gonna make corrections that are for this image only, but I'm gonna make them on a separate layer. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna click here and create a new field adjustment layer, okay? And then I'm going to lower the exposure on this one because all of your all of your layers in Capture One are applied at the same time. So if we go down here and we're going to play with the um, uh, background, for example, that's for making a black and white. Now you don't have to select the background layer to choose black and white, but if you make it black and white, the back that's where it's stored. It's on that background layer. So we'll go into here. We're going to enable black and white, for example. And then we say, okay, what else we want to do with this? Well, okay, now let's just start playing with it. But again. This was corrections for this image only, which was to bring that exposure down a little bit. 
Now, all of our style is everything that goes on the background layer. So it helps you organize your thoughts. So again, let's kind of do the same thing we did before. Although, um, yeah, we'll just do it this way. So create something we like here. And maybe we go back to the back on the black and white tool and we go and we play with the, the sensitivity of certain aspects of this. So I think you want a little bit more red there. Her robe is green, but I don't know if that's going to show up. Who cares? Something like that. These are not colors I typically play with. I'm just going to work with the skin here. So something like this. And I do want to lift this black up a little bit. Now you can do that here. You can do that here. This is a little bit different kind of creature though. Um, or you can go into the color balance tool and you can go to the shadow and you can lift it here. So they've got a whole bunch of different ways to do that. But that kind of softens it. Now there's no real true black. If I hover over this, you look at these numbers up here. You see the blackest part of this image is 20, 20, 20. There is no true black anywhere in this image. So uh, just be aware that that can look a little different if, that, if you're not used to that. I love it. I think it's really nice for boudoir. I don't want something maybe this aggressive, but um, I can be a little more aggressive with it than I would normally. And maybe, hey, maybe we add some film grain to this. Maybe we're like, let's just add a little bit of something, something. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in. And pick uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive level of film grain, perhaps. Maybe not that much, but um, again, I'm all about just crank it up to a million and then and then figure out what the controls do and how you like them by wiggling them. Now just move it up a little bit and call it good enough. So something like this is kind of nice, um, but I like it. I was about to soft green or fine green. That's not really doing anything for me. Harsh green. Wow, you certainly named that one, right? Let's use soft green. Let's just call this good. So we had a little bit of film grain there. We're all happy with this. This looks good. So now let's let's save this style. So again, the way that I do this is I just I copy, and then I go to my adjustment clipboard, which is down here, and I choose what what will go into this. Well, all this stuff will, right? Everything we have here. But I don't want this adjustment layer where we made that correction. We don't want to include that in this style. Uh, because that's obviously exposure just for this image, and that was a correction we made to avoid creating a recipe that would trash other images specifically, or potentially. Now save our clipboard style as. So we're going to call this, I'll put it in my directory here, and we'll call this uh, Sherry uh, Soft DNW. Sherry Soft Soft. Black and white. And we'll hit save. All right. So now if we back out, we can highlight all these other images. Go over here to, they're all set to series. So let's just pick this one. And notice it's set, it's going to stack them right now. Uh, so you can unstack those. You can have it up here. You can have stack styles that allow you to pick more than one. Uh, this can lead to some issues, uh, but it also opens the door for artistic happy accidents. So just be aware of that. Okay, so we applied it to all these and that's great, but you can still see some of these need some exposure love, but it's each one has its own little challenge to it. And I don't necessarily want all of them to have the same, the same thing. Looks so like I did some adjustments on these already. Like it depends on each image, but the rest of the image, the rest of the aspects of the image, I'm not gonna change. That's horrible, don't do that. <laughs> and if I want a little bit more window, whatever. I'm not a big black and white guy. What can I say? I'm trying, darn it. I'm trying my best. It's just not something I really enjoy that much. Um, but there you go. So that's how you would create a style and then apply it to a bunch of images. Again, if we don't like it, we select all those images and we can just reset them. Um, and it's obviously going to reset all of them, you know, including the crop. So be, be aware of that. But then we can go and say, well, let's try a different style. Let's, um, I want to try Hannah, for example. And I tend to do it on just one. Uh, so if you hover over your styles as you're looking through, you can see what it looks like, like that. This is better. Um, Chelsea, that's pretty nice, actually. Angela. So there you go. You basically just create your library of styles and have what you have. By the way, all of these styles are available uh, for the monthly um, people who are helping out with the with the YouTube channel. So
for the cost of a Starbucks. You get all these. Uh, you only have to do it for one month, by the way. You get them all. It's not like a, you only get only the new ones. You get all the ones I've put out so far, which is quite a few here. But uh, so like this is a bit crunchy on this image. I don't really like it. So I think the one we made today is really nice. But there is our, our golden one. And here's our one we just created. So, yeah. Now, I do like to, to have it so all the images that are in a set, because these are going to appear in a book, for example, um, all next to each other, potentially. Uh, I want the, all the black and whites to stay together, and I want them all to look like they're the same black and white. Um, I don't tune each black and white independently because I don't want them to look like a, a kid did it. I want them to look like they are all done on purpose by the same exact photographer. So these all look like they belong together, and they should, you know. If I need to make individual exposure adjustments to these, then I would do so. But uh, I'm not trying to make them look so disparate that they don't make sense. So something like this. Obviously, you didn't retouch or scan or do anything on these yet. I'm just showing styles. I typically only apply the styles to things that would be in the output folder, not here. Don't apply a black and white before you go into Photoshop to retouch it because you will have to deal with the fact the client may come back and say, can we get that one color? And then you have to do the skin again. Uh, S.E. Dickerson asked, have you ever make camera profiles? I do not uh, actually make camera profiles. I've used them a few times. Uh, been opportunities for, for that. But in general, um, I play with the images so much that the camera profile really hasn't made a significant difference to me. Um, I, I know that a lot of people, it makes a, a lot of difference. But in, in what I'm doing, it's so, I don't know, playful in even the even the skin tone uh, i oftentimes don't even white balance an image because i know when i come i'm going to come back i'm going to really mess with it but uh, that's that's confidence over time in in getting used to what your customers like and customers want a certain look from me and it's not that i'm applying this style and they're coming they're coming to me for this style i guess my images have a certain look even though i'm not trying to do it on purpose and if you don't know what your style is i can tell you how to find it Everyone can find their style the exact same way. That is, take a just take a thousand pictures, uh, not your pictures, by the way. Just go on Pinterest or someplace like that. And if you start just saving every picture you come across that you like, it might be a flower, it might be a girl, it might be a car, whatever it is you like, you save all the ones that you like. And you go back and you look at them, they're all going to smell the same way. They're all going to have a certain something and that something is you. That's your style. It's what you love. Because if you create an image that smells that same way, you're going to be really happy with it. And it's just a matter of finding what that is. Maybe it's that it's it's really saturated. Maybe it's a maybe it's the magenta teal thing that's going around. Maybe it's a black and white. Maybe it's you know whatever it may be. Now this is obviously independent of the context of the image. Like what is it? Is it you know an H.P. Lovecraft you know squirming you know vicious creature. I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I love images like that. Those are, are, they're inspiring to me, but I may not like the style of them. What I'm talking about is pick images that you enjoy the look of, and you'll find that your style is right there. And all you have to do is figure out how to reproduce that style. And you found what will make you happy. And I think this is a major thing everybody should do as soon as possible. One of the best ways to do that is kind of undo the composition of the camera from your post-production. Meaning being a good photographer and being good at post-production are two completely different skills. Uh, and, and don't assume that you have to do both, by the way. Uh, I know a lot of amazing photographers that outsource all of their retouching. I mean, th because they don't want to do it. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not what they're good at. Uh, so the skin looks terrible. Um, and they're, they're not that attention to detail person. Plus they make money clicking a shutter, not sitting in front of Photoshop for 12 hours a day. Right. I outsource a lot of my images actually when they're going to go in a book because they're not going to be printed any bigger than eight by eight. And I can send them off. I have a lady named Jessica who does all my retouching for me for those types of things. Now, if it's going to be printed very large, it's mine. That because I, no one will do skin to the level of satisfaction that I need other than me, right? And I know my style. But when I'm sending it to her, she's fixing the skin and that's all she's doing. When it comes back to me, I'm color grading it to what I like. I'm color grading it to that thing that I enjoy. And I try and mix it up a bit, but I guess I don't mix it up enough because people ever, they always tell me that they can tell when it's something that I did, which I think is weird, but... I guess I have a style, 
but it's I sure as hell can't figure out what that what that is. I just know I when I really like an image, I really like it, independent of the retouching of the skin and so on and so forth. But that being said, uh, I also think one of the greatest things you can do for yourself as a photographer is put a 50 millimeter lens on your camera, one of those hundred dollar nifty fifties. Every camera manufacturer makes one. Put it in your camera and leave it there for like four to six months. Don't zoom. Because zooming changes so much of your image that it, it blows your it, once you once you figure it out, it'll blow your mind as to what you're doing to yourself. And when you get that 50 millimeter, something happens in your head and you get what they call the photographer's eye. You're suddenly able to compose images a lot quicker and a lot more interestingly than if you zoom. Zooming is like a crutch and it it takes the the ability for you to create these photographer eye situations away. And when you lose that, uh, there's no way to, to train it. You know, you can't get better at something if there's no one giving you feedback. And one of the, that's another reason why I really love image competition is because if any one of these pictures, if I show these to her boyfriend, right, do you think, or her husband, I don't know if she's married or not, I show them to her. Do you think he's going to say anything negative about any single one of these? Do you think she's going to say anything negative about any one of these? So I'm not going to get good feedback from her on her images. She's going to love them and say, oh my God, you're the best photographer ever. I'm so happy I booked this session. And then she's going to write me an amazing Google review. And that's awesome. But that did not help me solve any problem I had here as a photographer. Is her pose dumb? Did I light it poorly? Did, did I retouch the skin like a kid? You know, what things that I do wrong aren't going to come from positive feedback. I need negative, constructive feedback. And maybe not negative, but I need constructive feedback. And that's where image competition comes in because those are judges that have been trained. They go through training to be a judge, by the way. And then they give you feedback that's useful and not an opinion. I had one guy once, oh, like, I still, I can't remember the guy's name, but I blocked him on Facebook. I posted something to a group and he's like, dude, he's like, that's like the most embarrassing, horrible picture ever. Why would you even post that online? It's so embarrassing. And I felt horrible. I'm like, wow, that's just horrible. I must, I'm, I mean, I'm in the wrong business. I don't know. So I go and I look at his portfolio, expecting to see some sort of really great gem of information, right? He shoots trains at intersections in broad daylight at, the, at you know noon. That's what he does. He gets out of his car and takes pictures of trains at intersections. And he's picking on me about some boudoir picture. I'm like, okay, this is not a person who's giving me insightful, constructive feedback. This is a person who's got an opinion about something. And I cannot benefit from an opinion, right? So as we, as we kind of develop our style and we start to, to figure out what it is that we like and what we enjoy, you will get that style and you'll start to apply it to your own imagery. And if you, again, if you don't know what that style is, you can find it. Just get online and start saving pictures that you enjoy the look of, not the composition of or the content of. Like I, I have so many... Um, like HP Lovecraftian or type you know, gothic horror types of not blood and gore and anything like that. I like arcane horror kind of stuff. I have so many of those images I say because I really am inspired artistically by them, but I'm not inspired perhaps by their colors or, or other things, but it could be the, the movement through the image inspires me. It could be the framing of something and I'll just save all those and then I start to look at them later. By the way, the technical word for that collection is a morgue, kind of like where you keep dead people. It's the exact same word spelled the exact same way. That is a collection of visual information. So uh, when I was in architecture school years ago, we all had a morgue and we'd go through magazines and we'd rip pages out and put them into files. And hey, these are buildings that I like the exteriors of, or these are interior designs I like, or these are furniture designs I like. And over time, you start to build up those those different morgues of information. And I did the same thing when I started photography. I kind of went in and say, these are the color, the colors I love. These are the, the ways that I like to retouch. And I figured out what it was. Not to say I'm going to copy it, but it was like, I don't even know where I'm supposed to go. Because if I look at some of my earlier work, I'm all over the map. And, and some of it's a little too crispy. Some of it's a little too blurry. Uh, but once I kind of figured out what I enjoyed and how to reproduce it, then I can take that as a point of departure and then play with it. Again, I don't want everything to look the same, but 
I want the image, each image to kind of give me information about what it wants to be. Not that I'm going to force it into one specific preset because that's my style. Um, I want to start there and then I want to wiggle it and see, can it be better? And it's like when we talk about, um, when we apply our, our different tonations to things here on this, on this channel, for example, I always say we go and we pull this all the way to the edge and we go all the way around and we look for what this image wants. And nine times out of 10, if you're a fan of this channel, you'll find me right over in here. I love this blue. Now I'm looking just at this, right? Um, and a little bit in the face, but this is too much. So I'll just, I'll just take and bring it back a bit. And then I'll do, I know that the other side is where her skin's going to live. Now in this specific in instance, she's going to get a bit orange, right? So I may not have to pull that over too much. In fact, if she's too orange, I can pull again, the other direction to desaturate her skin. But this is starting to look like my style. <laughs> I didn't do that. I'm per All I did was start here and start fiddling with it. <laughs> You're renaming your inspiration folder to morgue right now. <laughs> yeah, I actually look at the, the dictionary definition and it will it'll tell you that. Um, but yeah, this, this whole part here, I think is probably the biggest point of departure for styles. Uh, you'll see a lot of people who do the, the magenta cyan type of mix that's done here as well. Now, Photoshop has much more powerful tools for doing a lot of crazy stuff. In fact, I may actually do a series on that. I, this channel isn't one that people come to for a lot of Photoshop advice. Uh, I think because, um, well, I mean, I'm more of a problem solver with Photoshop. I go into it to, to solve a problem or to push an image into a certain area. Uh, where a lot of the other ones are more like, hey, here's how you do this specific thing. And I think I didn't want my channel to be a place where you would say, oh, I got to remember to write down that one video that I remember seeing how to do that on the one guy's channel. I want you to come here and say, this is how I solved this problem and here are the tools I used to do it. It's more than one tool. Um, so I, it's a little bit different, I guess, goal with what I'm trying to do here. Uh, but to to really color grade the crap out of this image, we would use other methods that are not available inside of Capture One. Um, and, and those methods, I, I wish they were in here, kind of, but and a lot of me is, I wish Capture One would finish its product. Uh, they, they've gone so far in so many ways and then they just kind of stop, like keywording, just every single day, keywording drives me absolutely nuts. Um, this whole train wreck in here um, just bothers me, but that's another day. But anyway, so I, I kind of wanted to talk about style today a bit and how to kind of I don't know, find your style, but then also how to save it, apply it and reuse them, how to back them up uh, because uh, they're again in a dumb location and how to use this adjustment clipboard, which I really, really like. I think this is a really great tool. Uh, so you don't feel like you have to take everything that was done in the specific image and live with it. You can always take just certain parts and apply it moving forward. Uh, so if you have any questions, comments, witticisms, criticisms, heresies, or fallacies, throw them in the comments below, and I'll try and get to them. I answer every comment that's put in this channel. Uh, since there aren't a lot of them, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so if you are going to Shutterfest, uh, make sure you hunt me down and say, hey, uh, I'll be there. And then one day later, I'm going to be at Texas School. If you're not familiar with Texas School, it's texasschoolofphotography.com, uh, I believe that is. It might be .org, I'm not sure. And uh, that's one week with me, and that's in two weeks. And we're going to be, I think it's only 20 people maximum. And we're going to be shooting, we're going to be lighting, we're going to be doing a lot of post-production and a lot of other really kind of interesting stuff like copyright. We're going to be covering copyright, we're going to be covering M NFTs, because I've been selling NFTs since April, and I've been doing copyright stuff for years. And all that stuff is uh, information I think that that a photographer needs to know at depth uh, to protect yourself and to actually make money off of it. Um, let's say I made quite a bit of money last year suing people. So it's, it's a, hey, it's a fun thing to do. If you're going to steal my images, let's make a car payment out of it, right? Or a car out of it. <laughs> but if you're at any of those events, make sure you hunt me down and let me know. Um, if you have improvements to the channels, things you want me to cover or I haven't been doing, this is as much for you as it is for me. I like to teach. And if you guys like the channel, let me know. Um, I have some other things I want to be doing here. As I said, I keep trying to, I want to get into the 3D stuff because I do so much of it, but this channel is not for 3D. And I do I muddy the water? Do I mix it all together? Um, I'm kind of arguing with myself on whether I want to do that or not, or keep it just to capture one in Photoshop. Uh, but I think uh, I'm, I'm leaning toward its visual imagery and that's what I do, uh, regardless of what 
what platform it's on. I mean, I even do some DaVinci stuff. Like, do you want to see some DaVinci Resolve stuff? Uh, uh, I'm not God's gift to it, but I can certainly use it well enough. Um, but, um, it, you know, so things like that. I was like, oh, I don't know if that counts for this channel. That's just going to muddy the water too much. But 3D stuff, I'm starting to look at a lot of my imagery and add 3D elements to them. And that's when this starts to apply more. You know, do I want, you know, an extra window in the scene? Do I want other things that I don't have stock photography for? I'm going to have the opportunity to create them and put them into the images, which I'm finding myself doing. Um, a lot of my image competition this year, my competition images, which I really can't show yet, um, all have 3D assets in them that I've made, rendered, and lit just as if they were in the scene. And they look completely convincing. And I think that is the future of our industry. You know, we are, yeah, we put our camera out there, but there's what, there's 12 photographers per square mile in the average U.S. city. You know, so if you're just saying, well, within a five mile radius is all the clients I'm looking for, you got a hundred people to contend with. Uh, so realize that it's, uh, well, more than a hundred people. You've got a big group of people to, you get to contend with, even with a five mile radius. So what are you doing to differentiate yourself? You know, put that nifty 50 on your camera, learn to get the photographer's eye, learn what your style looks like by again, saving articles or different uh, images, go to Pinterest and create a big pin board. And I bet you'll find what you love and then don't imitate it but use it as a point of departure to find what you can do to make it better so you like it even more, and then you will have your own thing. Uh, and it's not to say that they all have to look alike. You can have more than one style, but you have to find a place. And a lot of, tell you, a lot of people tell you that consistency is key. Um, in a way, if someone wants what you're selling and they know that you're the only one who makes it, they will come to you for that, right? I mean, it's that simple. If you're the only one who makes it, you have no competition. Uh, so if you're trying to imitate someone, you are already saying, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have competition because I'm, I'm actually taking that person's style and making it my own as well. Uh, so, so just be careful there. Be yourself, be unique, do what you love, and people will find you and have you do that thing. <laughs> it's that easy. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've shot, I said seven, eight boudoir sessions this last week. Um, it's on fire right now. I shoot a lot of it. And uh, each each woman's different. Each thing they come in is different. But my style is my style. And they book me because they like my style. They don't book me because I'm cheaper, because I'm not cheaper. I'm also not the most expensive person in this in this area, by the way, either. I'm I'm up there, but I'm not anywhere near close to the, some of the other people. But I think they, they like my work better than hers, which is makes me feel pretty good, uh, which means I should be raising my prices, right? Uh, which, you know, that's, that's one of those things in this industry. It's uh, a lot of people race to the bottom. Do not do that because you won't be in it for long, first of all. And no one wants the cheapest person doing it. Well, nobody you want to have as a client because those, the people who come in wanting the cheapest price are always the most labor intensive people. They're the, always the clients that want everything for free and they're in your face I got people who come in and they spend a good amount of money and they're the kindest people because they trust me as a professional. They're not out trying to get a bunch of stuff for a bargain. I should make a whole video on that because I've seen it, oh, geez, so many times on how that stuff goes down and what people want and what they think they want. Um, I have people come in and they tell me how they want me to photograph things. I'm like, well, you're hiring me because I'm the professional, but yet you're telling me exactly where you were going, what time of day we're going to do it. I mean, you, know, you tell me what it is that you want. Oh, we want a family picture because grandma's getting older and we've got three generations here. Wonderful. What? Where's a place we can go that grandma can have access that has meaning to your family? Well, we want to go here. We want to, no, I get it. Let's pick a time of day that works for the light that I can bring my studio light, you know, have an assistant holding a nice modifier to light it properly. I will be your guide to giving you what it is that you want. Don't tell me how I'm supposed to photograph grandma. I know how to do that. That's why you're hiring me. So it's this whole attitude shift that I tend to bring to things. That's a little bit different. I know but that's what it is. But anyway, thanks for listening to my rant for like the last 20 minutes. <laughs> I hope you guys had fun today. Uh, again, if you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And once again, thank you, uh, SE Dickerson for being one of the supporters of the channel. I think we're up to a little over 40 people now. Um, who are helping to support the channel and you guys make this all happen because YouTube ad revenue is not doing it. But uh, I'm happy to keep throwing you guys toys for helping me out. So really appreciate it. And I hope to see everybody at Shutterfest in Texas. Cool. Everybody take care, stay safe, 